In eighth grade, my innocence felt like it was taken from me. I was only 12 when the school year began, and I was already accustomed to being more mature than my peers since I practically raised my four-year-old sister. I had to fulfill parental responsibilities like cooking and cleaning, etc. I also wasn't good at saying no or putting my foot down. Me being too kind caused me problems in my life, which I will mention shortly. There was a special needs boy who I'll call Carl, who attended three of my six daily classes. Whenever anything involved a partner, teachers would always pair me up with Carl. I didn't mind, because I disliked how rude my classmates were to him sometimes. It wasn't his fault both he and his twin brother were born with Down Syndrome. He was actually a very nice kid, and always had interesting facts about any given subject. This is where the long history of my stalker experience begins. You see, Carl had a teacher's aide assigned to him. I will call him Matthew. So since I was already partnered with Carl, I decided I would also be friendly towards Matthew as well. This is a decision that I would come to regret. Matthew was 29 at the time. Again, let me remind you that I was only 12. After about three months into the school year, I was getting along great with Matthew and Carl. All was going fine until one of the more popular girls in my grade asked me randomly in front of everyone why Matthew was always touching me. I told her I had no clue what she was referring to, and two other girls chimed in and backed her up, telling me to pay more attention over the next few days. And I did. I started to realize that Matthew always had a hand either on my shoulder or back, sometimes my lower back. This made me extremely uncomfortable because I had never even realized how hands-on Matthew was until now. One day I told him to stop when his hand was way too close to my right breast. This occurred during the final class of the day. My exact words were, Matthew, please don't touch me. It was like if I had cursed his ancestors or something, because he flipped out, pulling away his hand as if I had burnt it. He then waited for the teacher to walk in, then yelled at me in front of everyone. You've changed. You need to grow up. I thought you were different. He then stormed out of the room, almost knocking over the teacher in the process. The teacher followed him outside, and as soon as the door shut behind him, everyone turned their head towards me and asked me what I had done to set him off like that. I told him exactly what I said to Matthew. Even Carl, who saw the whole thing, defended me. What I had least expected was even the popular girls in my class took pity on me. They said if I got into trouble because of this, they would say something to the teachers. The teacher came back in and asked me what happened, and I told her what transpired. The teacher wouldn't believe me, even though I had never given her problems before and was always a straight-A student. That day was the first of many awful days to come. Matthew began demanding why I had changed so abruptly, and started trying to pretend nothing had happened, and proceeded to still touch my shoulders and back. I stood my ground every time, especially since my classmates were there to back me up. Eventually, it escalated to where he would randomly wait for the teacher to walk in, and then start yelling at me. Even during lunch, he would go looking for me on the campus and try to talk to me. It was all very awkward having to deal with him. How he managed to become a teacher's aide is beyond me. I began hanging out with the other staff in the office to get away from this unhinged weirdo. He attempted his harassment there until the front desk lady noticed that I was visibly uncomfortable and even overheard me telling him not to touch me. She immediately hauled ass to get him away from me, and from that point on, the office was a safe area. The straw that broke the camel's back was the day that I struggled to pack all of my things into my school bag so I wouldn't be stuck alone in the classroom with Matthew. He took advantage of my predicament and cornered me in the back of the classroom. 
I failed to mention this before, but Matthew was six foot four. I was mortified and tried to scream, but because of my panicked state, I couldn't. Matthew glared at me and placed his hands on my shoulders. Before he could say anything, there came a voice from the doorway. Hey, what's going on back there? I then took that opportunity to book it out of there. The next day, my science teacher asked me what happened. She had her detention slip waiting for me, but wanted to hear my side of the story first. I told her that Matthew had been touching me, and I wanted him to stop, and no one seemed to be doing anything about it. She saw that I was visibly shaken and on the verge of tears, and then said the only reason that she wasn't going to give me detention was because she wanted me to return to my old self. Not because of what I told her about Matthew. I was beyond belief at this point. I had told multiple members of the school staff about what Matthew had been doing, and none of them were doing a damn thing about it. They wanted to sweep it under the rug and pretend that everything was just fine. This continued on for months, and yet not one teacher did anything to defend me. My grades began to slip. I went from a straight-A student to an average C. My parents were furious at me when my report card came in. I finally broke down and tried to tell my dad the truth, but he wasn't having any of it and slammed the door to his room in my face. I then went to my mom and told her everything that was happening at school. Finally, an adult listened to what I was saying, and my mom hauled ass to the school the next day and raised hell. They immediately escorted her to the principal's office. I'm not sure what happened from there, but from what my mom mentioned, she got into a screaming match with the principal about my situation, and some of the staff members came forward and backed up my character. Before all this started happening, I didn't have the reputation of being a problematic student. Unfortunately, Carl was removed from all of my classes. I heard stories from some of the other students that Matthew would belittle and reprimand Carl whenever he failed at an assignment. Matthew's conduct eventually caught up with him, and he was ultimately fired. He did the same thing to another female student, and it became impossible to ignore. Matthew disappeared for about a year after that. I remember one day that I was shopping at the local mall with my father when out of the corner of my eye, I saw Matthew crouching behind something, trying to do his best to stay out of sight. The sight of him freaked me out, and I began telling my dad frantically that I was being stalked. However, by the time that my dad went to go investigate, Matthew had vanished. Fast forward to my junior year. My mom was part of an adult soccer team, and I would sometimes go and watch them play. During one of her matches, one of her teammates brought along a person to spectate. It had been a couple of years since I last saw Matthew. But once I made eye contact with this man, there was no mistake. It was him. I wanted the ground to swallow me whole the moment I recognized him. I quickly excused myself and hauled ass out of there. Thank goodness my dad and a bunch of other people were there or Matthew might have just picked up where he left off years before. A couple of years went by. It was now the fall semester of my second year in college. I had pretty much moved on from Matthew at this point, and was making progress and trusting adults again. One day I was heading to class when I noticed a group of men lounging in the quad area of the campus. As I got closer, I froze in place because one of the men looked very familiar to me. When we made eye contact, there was no doubt on my mind that it was Matthew. I quickly rushed past, hoping that I was just seeing old ghosts. However, I would not be so lucky. The stalking began again. Matthew would circle me like a shark wherever I went. Whenever I would look out an adjacent window during class, he would be standing somewhere off in the distance, looking directly at me. Whenever I found myself walking down a hallway alone, a chill would creep up my spine. 
I would look behind me, and there he was, peeking out at me from around the corner. One day, he followed me into the cafeteria and methodically sat at a table next to me. Thankfully, I was with a group of friends. He began eating a slice of half-eaten pizza someone left behind and was staring directly at me the whole time, like some kind of animal. I discreetly called for security, and as soon as they arrived, I pointed right at Matthew and told him that this man had been stalking and harassing me. Matthew spit out the pizza and then bolted through an exit door before campus security could confront him. I was embarrassed because everyone in the cafeteria stopped what they were doing to see what was happening. An investigation into Matthew was launched, and the security footage of him roaming the halls corroborated my story, and helped me build a case against Matthew to finally get a restraining order against him. Unfortunately, Matthew disappeared once again, and I haven't seen him since that day in the cafeteria. I'm grateful that he's gone, but at the same time, I'm not because not knowing what he's up to now is driving me crazy. He could be stalking someone else for all I know. That's a terrifying thought. I wish many times over that I had never befriended Matthew all those years ago. I'm now 24, and I have moved hundreds of miles away from my hometown. If anyone listening is being harassed or stalked, don't wait until it's too late. We all deserve to enjoy our lives carefree from any kind of harassment. I hold no resentment towards those who struggle to tell their story. But this entire ordeal took a toll on my mental health and has made it difficult for me to trust anyone. I'm always looking over my shoulder wherever I go, and I've switched to online-only classes to avoid being on campus. Since I've moved away, I've tried my best to move on. However, I use this experience to teach children the importance of speaking up. Believe me, I know it's hard to even think straight in the heat of the moment, but the more you stay silent, the more the problem will grow and damage you in ways that you can't even fathom. I'm a 17-year-old male from England. When this took place, I was 16 and it was December of last year. Me and my mates live in a small village located about 20 miles south from Manchester. Two minutes on the train from us was a larger village, which we would frequently visit as we attended school there. And there was also more stuff to do. Our small village didn't really offer much for a bunch of amped up 16 year olds. There was this old abandoned office building in the larger village that was about a 5-10 to 10 minute walk from the village center where all the shops were. The old office building was quite creepy to look at at night. Each floor was the same. A huge office space to the right of a staircase leading to the back stairwell. To the left were the toilets and various other side rooms. We would sneak in through a broken window that we would then cover up so no other people would know that we were in there. Once in the building, the first thing we did was go up on the roof and get a bird's eye view of the village below. One night, me and three of my friends decided to play a game of hide and seek in the old building. The rules were that the seekers had to count on the roof and give the hiders at least five minutes before coming down to look for them. After several rounds and changing up teams a couple of times, one friend and I decided that it would be a good plan to hide near the ladder so when the Seekers came down, we would discreetly climb up and hide out on the roof. After successfully making our way up to the roof without being seen, we stayed up there for about a half hour. The two Seekers eventually got bored of looking for us and came to the roof, where we jumped out and scared them for a laugh. How long have you guys been up here? One of them asked. I kept saying that we had been up there the whole time. He looked at me, confused, but didn't say anything else. I thought nothing of it, so we decided to play one more game before heading out. It was now our turn. We started the timer, and the former Seekers descended the ladder. Once five minutes passed, we began our search. Once we got to the top of the stairs, 
I looked through one of the big main offices, where you could see the back stairs, and I saw one of the hiders walking down them. I thought that I would be sneaky and go down the main stairs and cut them off. But when I got there, they were gone. Fifteen minutes later, me and my partner were getting bored and a bit creeped out. We knew that they were somewhere in the building because we kept hearing footsteps, doors closing, and what sounded like things being dropped on the floor. We decided to cheat and FaceTimed one of the hiders. When my friend picked up, we were mortified to see Christmas lights outside the building. They had ditched us, and whatever we were hearing wasn't our friends. We immediately hung up and looked at each other before hauling ass out of there. After meeting back up with the other two, they went on to say that to get back at us for outsmarting them, they thought it would be funny to leave us in the building knowing someone else was definitely in there with us. After calming down because I was utterly pissed off at them, we then all talked about what we saw. My friend explained that when they were trying to find us, they both saw someone on the back stairwell and also heard people talking. They began hearing doors opening and closing and what sounded like random things falling to the floor. When they both realized that we were actually on the roof, that's when they decided to leave and play a prank on us. I responded by telling them that I also saw a figure on the back stairs and how we also heard the exact same things that they did. To this day, I still have no idea what was in there with us. We had been in that building several times before and never had that problem. Thinking that for hours on end, we were playing hide and seek, unaware that something or someone was in there with us, makes me feel sick. The building was demolished a month after this happened, and they plan on replacing it with a housing development. This is a photo of the front of the building taken back in the 90s, when the building was still in operation. So this has to be the strangest thing that I have ever experienced. At the time, it was very unsettling. I'm from the Bristol area in the southwest region of the United Kingdom. Back in July of 2001, I was working my first job at a local department store while studying for my final GCSE exams. I was 16 at the time. I used my pitiful first month's wages to buy my first mobile phone, a Nokia 3210. At first, everything was pretty normal, and I was enjoying the novelty of communicating while on the move and sending short messages, etc., that was until I started getting random missed calls from the future. I would get these bizarre missed calls, either during my shift or just before it started. When I checked the details, I got the same date and time on every occasion. One missed call, no number, December 31st, 2049. New Year's Eve, nearly 50 years into the future, when I would be 66. These calls always came from a quote, no number. It didn't say unknown number, it said no number. That was unusual, even for cell phones in the early 2000s. Most people I tell the story to try to rationalize this by saying, oh, the phone date was just set incorrectly. But I proved this wrong by showing them that the phone was displaying the correct date. I would have chalked this up to a one-off glitch if it had happened only once, but I lost count after this happened at least 13 times over the space of a month. On the 11th time it happened, I caught the call as it was ringing. When I picked up, I heard a bunch of garbled alien-like noises. It was almost like the chirping and whirling of an old dial-up modem, only much more advanced and organic sounding. Unfortunately, it was too fuzzy and distorted to make anything else out. I've tried searching forums, chat rooms, and various other websites for a few years afterward, looking for any kind of rational explanation, but I found nothing. The call stopped around December of 2001, 
but the creepiest thing was that every time I missed the call, a strange sensation came over me, like I was being watched very closely. No one was ever in close proximity to me when I found out that I had missed a call. I remember trying to take photos of the screen as evidence, but it was somehow never visible in all the pictures I took in any light. Remember, 20 years ago, we didn't have cameras built into phones, and screenshots weren't a thing either. So what do you think? Was it a random error, or was it my future self trying to warn me about something? Could it have been aliens, or was it some kind of temporal communication technology being tested on me? Or perhaps it was just another glitch in the Matrix. All I know is that it felt very wrong at the time, like I had accidentally stumbled upon something I shouldn't have. There's always a reason to be afraid.